Come on, let's appreciate our apostle today. And Lady Gloria, come on, let's bless them real good. We thank God for their labor and for their leadership. And God bless all of you. You may be seated. Uh, I am honored to be here. I'm going to just expedite the time a little bit to catch up a little bit on the timing that we have today. We do have uh, a word of the Lord relative to the assigned area. The Lord has asked me, uh, that apostle asked me to speak on on behalf of uh, this incredible network. My lovely wife, yes, she would have been with me. Uh, he is absolutely correct. Uh, we're in the midst of a major period of fasting and consecration for our entire church body about some uh, very... Um, Incredible and important things the Lord has me doing. In fact, he mentioned Washington just last week. I met with um, on the top of a big, uh, large mountain in an area. I don't even know where they took me by private jet. Met with five of the most powerful men in the world. And uh, literally while we're sitting there and, uh, and, and dialoguing, uh, one of the gentlemen who's one of the president's top lawyers, phone rang three different times while we were meeting. It was the president of the United States on the phone uh, for him. And uh, there's some things that the Lord is doing and stirring now in the areas of government that I'm being uh, invited relative to. Uh, I'm not interested in any press. I'm not interested in any fame or fortune behind it. But I am interested in making sure that a prophetic voice of God uh, is speaking truth to power. And uh, we continue. So I solicit your prayers for that. But we came back, and my wife felt led to, uh, because of several things that are happening in that area, uh, to call our church to a time of uh, severe fasting and prayer. So even now, she's every morning, 5 a.m. To, to 9 a.m., but 5 a.m. to 7 is the main two hours, nonstop. She's on the call, and uh, we have uh, hundreds that are joining us on those prayer calls each morning. Then at 12 noon, again at 6 p.m., uh, and then again uh, at midnight. And then some crews are praying all night long. And I want to thank all of you for your, so we don't do that just during the consecration. It's more intense during that time, but that's part of our ministry. That's how we birthed our ministry. That's how uh, the Lord has blessed us throughout. And uh, I thank you for your uh, support as well. Many of you are intercessors are praying for us there in South Florida and uh, the different things that we're doing around the nations of the world. And uh, we thank God for that. I'm the senior vice presiding bishop of the Global United Fellowship, which now is over 1,400 churches in 42 nations. And uh, it is amazing testimony. I don't want to get off the track before I get on the track, but I do want to give the testimony and solicit your prayers because uh, part of what is opening up to us now with Cuba uh, is that we have now nearly 40 churches in Cuba that then they have to go through a process of being approved by their government just to be in uh, any religious opportunities. And uh, we're actually holding our first series of revivals in Cuba uh, in October, and I want you to be lifting that up as we go into a communist nation, amen, and raising up evangelical churches, Holy Ghost-filled churches that are going to transform that nation, amen? So I thank God. I love Apostle and Lady Gloria. I'm telling you, they're like, listen, that was no problem. The gifts and what have you, your family, you know, but I tell you what, you know, how many of you have seen the movie Coming to America? Anybody saw that movie years ago? Remember that? Eddie Murphy and Coming to America? I'm telling you, when we came up here to pick them up the first time they were over and I sent a van up, they called back and said, we need about three vans because they come into America. <laughs> <laughs> I got calls from all my guys that we sent up, and they were loading up vans and, and SUVs. And I said, who is this man that you've called here from? And, they, and I thought they were just kind of joking with me. And then when they arrived at West Palm Beach, I said, oh, my God, they did come to America. So <laughs> welcome back to America, sir. Amen. <laughs> welcome back. Listen, this morning, I want to take the time that I have to talk to you. I've been asked to speak per, uh, specifically on the area of unity as the, if you will, the, the undergirding of our flow in warfare, particularly for the United States of America, but all around the globe. And so I want us to deal with embracing the attributes of unity and synergy. Everybody say unity, unity. and synergy. Yeah. It is the foundation of our warfare, and it is the fuel to our prayer. 
want us to have that in our spirit, that unity and synergy, iron sharpening iron, as Apostle Frank, who I've known for years, was talking about uh, deep calling unto deep. It's the foundation of our warfare. Keep in mind, particularly as intercessors and persons that have deep prayer lives, that we can pray all we want, but the demonstration of God's power is going to come not only through our prayer life, but it is actually what happens is the unity and the synergy, iron sharpening iron, deep calling unto deep, is what gives fuel to our prayer. Because the enemy understands that when we're praying and we're praying individually and we're praying not in unity, not praying in one accord, he understands that it takes very little to disrupt the flow of what the Holy Ghost is really trying to do. Why? Because we're getting a download, yes, from the spirit realm, but not necessarily from the spirit of God. We're getting a download and everybody's hearing a different thing at a different time, moving in a different way. It is when we move in unity and in synergy that the force of prayer begins to take on a stronger, if you will, impact, particularly in the warfare, and I'll deal with that in a moment, that we're seeing in Western countries, particularly in Western countries. Uh, so it is the foundation of our warfare, it is the fuel to our prayer, and it is the key to our dominion. Those three aspects I want to kind of keep dealing with as I'm talking today. Prayer being fueled by unity and synergy, it's both that has to be in operation because see, you can be in unity and not be in synergy. A lot of people quote, in fact, the scripture uh, that tells us that we are to agree as touching. Uh, in, in Pentecostal, Pastor Frank did a great job of, you know, he messed with us Pentecostals on that, so I'm not going to start beating up on us Pentecostals. But, I, but us Pentecostals, we're big about saying, let's touch and agree. Do you know you can touch and not be in agreement? That's not what the scripture even says. It says, let's agree as touching. Let's agree as having an impact upon that which you are praying about. Just the fact that you're holding the hand, you can be holding the hand of a smiling devil. Okay, no amens coming from over here. I'm going to go over this side. You see, touching is not the essence of it. The agreement is the essence of it. So our unity and our synergy, I'm going to say it one more time, is one, the foundation of our warfare, two, the fuel to our prayer, and three, the key to our dominion. The scripture verse that is listed in our program for this passage uh, this time is Acts 2 and 1. We all know it. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were with one accord and in one place. That is when the Holy Ghost, of course, visited and fell and, 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 and we know the story there of how they all began to speak in tongues. Acts 2 42 through 46 is yet another passage that deals with in the founding of the New Testament church the essentiality of the functionality of unity and synergy. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles doctrine and fellowship. We're going to deal with that word fellowship a little more. Fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayer. Fear came upon every soul. That fear Fear is not meaning that it was a uh, that that we're panicking. It is a reverence. The word fear there, if you interpret that correctly, and many times in Scripture when we see the word fear, fear God, etc. Yes, there is a trepidation from the sense of we know He's all powerful, He is sovereign, all of those things. But God does not want us walking around trembling about who He is. He is a loving God. He is powerful. But we, in order to uh, to be operation as His sons and daughters, have to have a reverence of who He is. Right? A reverence. No different than a parent with your child. I don't want my son being scared of me. I want my son to know this is his safety. This is his ark of safety. This is the, the, the ones that love him. But I do need my son to have reverence of me. I am his dad. I am his father. Are you following me? I am, I am, if you follow my instruction, my direction, I'm the one that leads you to safety. So here it says, they, they had fear came upon every soul. What would happen in the body of Christ if we truly had a reverence one from, for another? I agree with Apostle Frank who talked about that word honor. Honor truly is, he said that's absolutely correct. Honor is the currency of faith. Honor is the currency of faith. Nothing moves without honor. And the number one ingredient lacking in America, we're seeing it at the the top levels of government all the way down is the ingredient of honor. If we had honor of God, we would have honor one into another. We're seeing that lacking in America and around the world. All that believe were together 
and had all things common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing. It has to be with consistency. It's not just a conference. It's not just an annual meeting. It must be with consistency, if not necessarily conformity, meaning that everyone isn't praying exactly the same, but we understand because there's different ways in different nations. You travel to the continent of Africa, there's a force and a fervor that's sometimes a lot different than in Western countries. Sometimes it is some people are led to pray, and, and it's not necessarily what they force on the sound. Others are very violent with their prayers. Others are very vocal with their prayers. And yet you can see sometimes I've seen people that just pray a quiet little prayer, but the power of their faith alone and their obedience to God brings about miracles, signs, and wonders, transformation in our nation. See, I believe that it's not just when we come together, uh, we're not seeing a demonstration of God's power just because those of us in this room uh, come together and we see a miracle or two, we see a hickey removed, or we see a neck, you know, that gets uh, resolved, or we see a pimple that disappears. Hello, somebody, right? That, that, that's, that's, that's not big stuff for me. Are you following me? I mean, there's enough power in this room. Everybody ought to be able to change some kind of way. Hello. Nobody should leave here with any kind of illness, any kind of sin. Do you know that you're sitting next to a Holy Ghost-filled believer? How in the world? So that doesn't move me that we can come into groups among ourselves. What moves me is when I see nations begin to be transformed, when I begin to see people honoring and loving one another in our society, when I begin to see the things that we're accepting as normal. There's a new normal in America, maybe not in the country you came from, but there's a new normal in America. We are accepting degradation. We're accepting things that I never would have thought that as a youngster growing up, I never would have thought some of the things we see as now normal and are accepting as normal and are, and are acquiescing to as normal. That is when I see those things starting to have impact. But like uh, 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 Pro, uh, Apostle uh, Frank was saying there, where he said they wouldn't even accept the uh, handout of the voter guides because they said they didn't want to get political. Let me tell you something. Everything that we're dealing with, there's not one sphere of influence under, on the earth that is not supposed to be impacted by kingdom people. And the reason why we don't understand it, one of the reasons that I, I'm finding that we have a disunity among the body of Christ is we are perfecting the art of joining churches as organizations and not joining the body of Christ as an organism. See, when we understand that every church, if it is properly being stewarded under the unction of the Holy Ghost, we're looking at how we are merged into a living organism, if you will. We're bringing our various talents, our skills, our anointings, our callings, and we are synergizing those and synchronizing those into a massive, unified, functioning army of God. Now, I get it. I mean, every church has its brand, has its, you know, its little moniker, has its vision, and all of that. And that's appropriate because they're in different communities. There are different needs in various communities. And you're called first, you know, you, it's, it's Samaria, Judea. We understand that. We don't just go to the outer parts of the world, and you're not doing nothing in your next-door neighbor. We understand that. So, yes, there is, there's a differentiation of visions that are there. But as a body of Christ, somehow those visions have to be merged into, and that's, that's where the issue is coming. It's not happening among churches because it's not happening among the people in the churches. Even within the churches, Apostle Frank said that too. He's talking about everybody's got a word. Everybody's got a different vision. Everybody wants to tell you about what they did from where they came from. Well, go back to where you came from because it's not the way it's going to happen here. Hello? But so we have to understand, everybody say, not an organization, but an organism. Yeah, a living, breathing, functioning, changing. Anything connected to God is constantly growing. And anything that's constantly growing is constantly changing. That doesn't mean we have to change for the worse. It means that we're allowing God to expand in us. Are you with me? It allows God to expand in us. You cannot say that you're going to do the will of God and you're still doing the was of God. What do you mean by the was? The was of God. See, we get so busy holding on to the old thing instead of doing what is the current thing of God that we're now in the was instead of the is. Amen. Whatever God is doing, I talked about that last year. Don't get me started on that because that's, that's something I've been teaching for years. And when, when God gave me the revelation of the parallel universe that we live in, that we're eternal beings operating in a temporal realm. 
that we come here not to be morphed into what is the temporal realm, but we come here from the eternal realm to cause the temporal realm to be transformed by that which is of God in the eternal realm. We are eternal beings. The Bible lets us know that we were in him before the foundation of the world. So if we were in him before the foundation of the world, let me ask you something. How old is God? When did he not exist? So guess what? How old are you? When did you not exist? It's not heretical. You have to understand. You were in God before you were in sperm. You were in God before you were translated from an eternal realm through the union of your mother and father that God chose in his sovereign will to put you here in this timing instead of 1940 or 1860 or 1710. God chose when he wanted you to come as a time capsule of his eternal will progressively being revealed in the earth. We're blessed that we're able to yoke together as believers in uh, 2019. Why? Because God has sovereignly ordained, which is why we cannot miss the moment. The Bible talks about don't miss the hour of your visitation. Judgment follows when we miss the hour of our visitation. What is the visitation of our society for this time? What is the visitation upon the church in this hour? No wonder that the devil is working overtime to cause divisiveness or divisiveness, as you might pronounce it, among the body of Christ. We spend more time arguing over doctrinal differences that don't have a thing to do with the power of God moving. We're arguing over whether we should wear lipstick or wear clothes, shoes, or, uh, uh, oh my God, we're dealing with stupid stuff. Tell your neighbor, come on, let's graduate from stupid. Has nothing to do. The world is moving forward every day, taking Hollywood by a storm, taking over the government, taking over uh, the, the seven mountains, I'll just say it that way, the seven mountains of cultural influence. And we're sitting in the church shouting and dancing and arguing about whether or not we should wear a weave or not. The white folk don't know about them weeds, but I know the black folk. Yeah, yeah you do, don't you? <laughs> All right, so here we are. Tell your neighbor, we got to graduate from the stupid. We got to graduate from the mundane. God saves people into a new community. That new community called the body of Christ is the avant-garde of a new humanity. It is not here just to say we got a bigger church, we're a mega church, or we're evangelicals, or we're this or we're that. It is here to say we are the body of Christ being formed now into where we can bring transformative impact upon the nations of the world. And so, as I'm saying, I said a moment ago, an, an apostle really got me started started on this Apostle Frank because he started dealing with that, that whole aspect of the eternal. And that, that's something I'm just, I, I, I guess we're just alike on that because I, I believe that heartily. I've taught on that for years. Our purpose precedes our presence. Our purpose precedes our presence. You are not here just because your mama and daddy got together wherever they got together in whatever year they got together. Hello, somebody. Whether it was at the movie theater, the drive-in theater, or I'm going to leave that alone. All right? You're not here by accident. God is not accidental. God is not coincidental. God is providential. Everything he does is by providence. Everything he does is by design. God is architectural. He is superstructural. He is infrastructural. God is hes an engineer. He is a master designer. He does not do anything by accident. Therefore, we are not here by accident. Our timing is not by accident. Our presence is not by accident. And we must understand that every day we are moving in new time, place, and manner. We're moving in new, in, we're in an intersection every day. Every day when we start the prayer call, I remind those that are on the prayer call, we need to thank God that we're now intersecting with a different time, place, hello, yes, and, and matter. It's not the same matter. It's not the same air you breathed yesterday. Thank God for fresh air. <laughs> right? These are not the same winds blowing today that were blowing yesterday. You're not getting the same raindrops today that you had yesterday. Hello? I don't even like myself the same every day. Right? You don't get up put on the same clothes every single day. Right? Why why do you change? You want a different color today. You're in a different mood today. You feel a little bit more, you you follow what I'm saying? When you feel down, you're wearing dark brown. When you feel up, you're wearing chartreuse. (laughs) 
right? So we're different. But I want to get this in our spirit. I'm going to move on quickly here. The eternal realm is the realm of is. Everybody say the eternal realm is the realm of is. What do I mean by that? It is where God, whatever God is saying, whatever God is doing, whoever God is, is. I am. That's why it says I am because I'm not was. I am. I'm always am. Isn't that interesting? Now, he says, the eternal realm is wherever God is. When God downloads from his mind the isness of God, we are to operate in the isness of God and not get stuck in the wasness of God. Eternal beings functioning, uh, eternal functions in a temporal realm. Now, if we go a little deeper than that, we also understand the church must become the empowering presence of the Holy Ghost that is guiding people. And, and I say it this way. It is the present witness of a future reality. We ought to be. We're not mimicking what the church used to do. We're not just echoing things of the past. Now, I'm not saying we abrogate or abandon in any way holiness and righteousness and and the things that we've been taught coming on. We know certain principles are the principles of God. That's why I believe, by the way, as well, that uh, if prayer is important, absolutely. Prayer is the foundation, absolutely. But let me tell you something as important as prayer, principles. Because God operates by principles. So you can pray and then don't abide his principles and it just won't work. Right. You can pray and then you don't have any expectancy, which he tells you his word will tell us over and over again how to walk in expectancy. You can't have the same mindset and you're praying for a different release. We have to elevate the mindset for receptivity of what we're even praying about. So in order for the church to be the present witness of a future reality, we have to have transformed minds. We're living in a post-Christendom age. We're living in a post-modern age. Well, basically, what all that is saying is, and, and, and uh, Apostle Frank dealt very well with the whole de- post-denominationalism age, right? There are still denominations, but that's not what's attracting people today. Millennials could care less whether you have stained glass windows or whether you're meeting in a garage, They want to know whether or not what you're speaking is relevant to my issue today. Now, the problem with millennials is they're trying to define or, 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 yeah, I'll say define their relationship with God based upon what they can understand of God. And so you have to be careful because you can never shrink wrap into a finite mind and infinite God. Right? We have to understand him by faith. We have to trust him by faith. But we're living in a world in which we've never seen it as such. It, it, from government on down, and I'm not going to be getting political either because it's not a matter of believing. I've been around government, been in Washington b- back and forth for 30 plus years now, served under several presidents of the United States with honor, and I'm, I'm glad to have done so. But I'm, so I know it's both Democrat or Republican. All right? It isn't a matter of the, the party on, on a lot of the issues that we're seeing. So let's just be clear about that. But I will say we have never seen on this order the loss of decency, common respect, honor one to another, respecting one another, respecting human beings as human beings. All right. That is a sign in the spirit. Now, keep in mind, God, whatever happens is not because God went to sleep. God will allow the Bible even says the work of iniquity, the mystery of iniquity will be allowed for a period of time. Are you with me? All right. Now, what is the number one reason? I'm getting like Apostle Frank. Now, I'll be all over the place in a minute. I see why he was all over the place. Y'all pulling on me over there. I see. I'm going to get back on this unity in a minute. But why, why, why is it? The Bible says it's because we had not love of truth. He says, I'm allowing iniquity to flow because it, it, you're going to be given over to all deceivableness, it says. He who comes with all deceivableness. Saints sitting here deceived because we won't abide principle. Simple principles. Oh, I want to hit you with one now. One that Pentecostals don't like. Order. Order. Right? Everybody trying to run something. Sit down somewhere. Right? Okay, this side now, the amen. They, under, they went under the chair. I saw one running right up under that chair. All right, so we're here as kingdom people, and we have to embrace our mandate for dominion. 
We are here to walk in dominion. And that's not an individual thing. We're to have victory over circumstances, over the world, and all of that individually. But that ought to coagulate corporately into dominion, where we're walking in dominion over the various spheres of influence in the earth. The Bible says in Daniel 7, 18, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom. Shall take the kingdom. Now, anytime you read about kingdom, you're talking about a unified, if you will, body of government, body of influence, etc., body of territory. Okay? Now, how are we to take that if we're not in unity as a kingdom? You can't take kingdoms individually. You might have territory, but it ain't a kingdom. Amen? And if you don't have followers, you're just taking a walk by yourself. The kingdom, it says in Daniel 7, 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness under the kingdom of the kingdom under the whole heaven, everything under the heavens shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high. Come on, slap somebody and tell them that's me and you. That's me and you right there. Ooh, she really slapped him. I'm sorry. Okay shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. That's the other thing we got to remember. This is larger than just us. It's larger than just our predecessors. It's larger than our ancestors. It's for a time that is eternal. We're to do our part. We're to occupy till he come. We're to occupy and do what we're supposed to do. But it's an everlasting kingdom. And the Bible says, all dominion shall serve and obey him. And then Daniel does something that's powerful. He does a drop the mic moment. He says, hitherto is the end of the matter. In other words, I'm not going to be disturbed by this anymore. See, we got to come to the point where we believe what we believe and start dropping the mic. You can't argue with fools all day. You don't have to make your point. Speak the truth and let God do the work. One plants, one waters. God has to give the increase. We're standing here trying to argue with people about dots and periods and commas and quotations and all this kind of stuff. And I was talking to a, a wonderful brother, Jehovah Witness, the other day, and he was just going on and on. And I just sat there and just got quiet for a minute. He said, see, it's making sense to you. And I said, no, absolutely. I said, actually, what I'm sitting here admiring is the fact that you have just talked yourself in a circle and don't even know it. Because what you were saying five minutes ago don't even make sense based on what you just said 30 seconds ago. And then I went back and unraveled that thing for him. See, we don't have to impress anybody with why we know so much. Some, oh, my God. Sometimes you can just wait until God gives you just one word of truth to put there. And it will unravel the entire philosophy. You're walking in, and many times I'm in these boardrooms and in these high-powered meetings and things, and the first thing I'm realizing is, number one, I'm not here of my own power. Therefore, I'm not here on my own agenda. Therefore, I need to shut my mouth until God tells me to speak up. And sometimes we have to do what the Bible says that nobody ever quotes, study to be quiet. There is such a thing that is spiritual silence. There is such a time where, see, nobody knows what you don't know till you begin to talk what you know. And particularly when you're dealing with men that are in power and with a lot of pride and all of that. I'm telling you, there are times where I have been asked in the meeting and said, well, Bishop Ray, what, what do you have to say? You haven't said anything about this. I haven't said anything about it. Well, the, the Lord will bring me to silence many times because when I do speak, I will have the attention of the whole room because I haven't yet spoken. Y'all going to get that next week. So, so I'm sitting there and I'm mulling over everything that's being said and, and it doesn't mean I agree with half of it. See, you don't have to speak up every time you disagree. Well, no, no, the Bible says. Okay, you just getting ready to get in a big argument. All right, And it's an argument usually that doesn't matter for the end point of the day. I try to go into these meetings understanding, God, what is the one point you want left here when I leave here? I'm not trying to score points that I know this scripture better than you, or I got a scripture in Colossians that, that, that rebukes the scripture you just read in Genesis. You see, we're throwing scripture back and forth. We're like the WWE of, of the spiritual world. 
the next match, who's on? You know what I'm saying? We're the WWE of the spiritual world, you know? And so who's the, who's the biggest, baddest that can, that can take it on right now? Have you noticed those guys in the WWE? They do more talking than they do wrestling. The talk is the game. That's what keeps you interested, all that talk that they be doing. The, if you really watch the match, they're just going from rope to rope. They spend half the time running around the ring avoiding one another. <laughs> and you can always tell who's going to win the match because the first one that's on top ends up being the loser. <laughs> Never fail. That's why you got to be careful how fast you take sides. Hello, somebody. Yeah. Amen. Tell your neighbor, that's a revelation from WWE right there. There it is. Listen what Justin Abraham says. He says, we become experts at teaching in the church. We have the prophetic ministry, healing rooms, counseling, and deliverance. We prophesy. We care for the poor. We engage in social action. We preach salvation. But why did we stop there? For nearly 2,000 years, most of the church has held back on the shores of unbelief, listening to hours of preaching, yet aiming for less than the design. That's powerful. We are sitting around. We're in revival after revival. Now, I was born, raised in Church of God in Christ. Listen, we was the shoutingest little folk. What nobody, I still don't think nobody going to heaven but us. I'm sorry. Okay. That was ingrained in me as a child. White folks surely couldn't go to heaven. Because we didn't have no white folk in my church. You see how narrow your world can become? All I knew was the precious saints. I just knew Mother Harris and Mother Gavin. And, you know, oh, my God. That's the, that's the ones going to, going to heaven. And so I, now I know I'm saved today because I was saved at least 8,000 times during my childhood in Church of God in Christ. Because there was no such thing as you got it today. It was come back tomorrow night because the Lord just blessed you tonight. You got to come and tarry. Oh, y'all don't know nothing about tarrying? Oh, yes, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. 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 Thank you. Come on, baby. Come on, baby. You're coming through, baby. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Hold on, baby. And one's telling you to hold on. One's telling you to give it up, baby. Give it Which one do you want me to do? Give it up or hold on? And so somewhere around the 6,000th time, I realized that the people that was foaming at the mouth and starting to have their eyes roll were perceived as getting the Holy Ghost. So around the 6,000th time, I started working up foam. And it worked. They told me, you got it, baby. You got the Holy Ghost. So since I learned, see, the Bible says, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? That may be the Bible, but in Kojic, you don't receive the Holy Ghost till you foam at the mouth. Rick Joyner says, as we proceed toward the conclusion of this age, the conflict between light and darkness will become increasingly supernatural. We're to be the vessels through whom the supernatural power of God. Do you understand nothing about you should be natural? That doesn't mean you can't be common. That doesn't mean you cannot work in the natural. But Apostle, he also mentioned about that. He actually said something about how you can, you can move back and forth in time. I say it a little differently. I believe you move in and out of time. Because God doesn't exist in time. Jesus, in fact, let us know that. He says, I am the gate. I am the door. You can enter in. And the Bible tells you, I'm not trying to go through all of that, but you check the scripture out. It lets you know that you can go in and out. In and out. When we learn how to flow to where we're into the presence of God, we're into the supernatural realm, that we return back and we now take what we have picked up, what we have got by revelation and by participation in the spirit realm, and we begin to live those things out practically. That's where we begin to see transformation. Now, so he says here, if we proceed, as we proceed toward the conclusion of this age, the battle between light and darkness is becoming increasingly supernatural. Folks, some of this stuff we couldn't make up. Some of this stuff, is so you look at the news sometime and you're like, that is just so obviously demonic. 
right? The, the things that our kids are rushing and society is rushing to the, to the movie theaters to look at. It's just amazing. And, and sites are among the foremost. Now, I'm not one of them that don't believe you can't go to the movie. I ain't, I ain't there, okay? I mean, you can learn a lot. You can go, et cetera, watching the right thing, of course. But because, I mean, I, I didn't come up under that. Hello. I was, I was, you know, come on, you too? Yeah. I couldn't go to the movie, right, because that, that was the devil's workshop and all of that. And I, you know what? I'll tell you this. I, I'll never forget because my mother was, you talk about a sweet little saint of God. I mean, and she didn't let you go to the movie, nothing. And I finally got her to go to a movie, and it was when the Ten Commandments came out. Charlton Heston and the Ten Commandments. And so I got my mom to go to the movie. We had to go by night. Okay. Went to the movie. But as it would be, the night we were in the movie watching Ten Commandments, a tornado came through downtown, broke all the glass out of the stores and stuff, and the movie stopped in the middle of the movie. My mama, if she could have cursed, that's where she would have cursed. Because she was like, she said, I knew I shouldn't have been in no movie theater. You got me down here. The devil is a lie. You go get a whooping when you get home. I was 18 years old. <laughs> I'm like, God, could you just help me a little bit here? Finally got mama to come into the 21st century and you let a tornado come through. Change is here. The present expression of Christianity is being transformed. Whatever comes next will not be irrelevant. We are not irrelevant bystanders to what's going on in our society. We are supposed to be the transformers. In fact, more than even transformers, we are not to wait on our future. We should be creating our future. We should be speaking those things that are not as if they were. And that's not just some fancy Pentecostal slogan. We should be doing it understanding the mind of God. That what we're speaking is the mind of God. It's not coming out of flesh. It's not coming out of political nuance. It's not coming out of just some fleshly desire. It's coming because we have truly got a dying download of the supernatural will and flow of God. And we begin to speak that. Not caring who hears. Not caring who believes. Not caring who accepts. Because once it has been enunciated into the atmosphere, it cannot be taken out of the atmosphere. You understand, sound never stops traveling. We're in this room today. This, the sounds that we're putting in this room today, I don't know who comes in here next, but I hope they saved. Because when they walk in, it's going to be hitting them all upside the head. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. Whatever spirit they walk in, in, the spirit of God that has been permeating through what we're speaking, through what we're saying one to another. That's why when the angels say, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy, he's holy. You are creating a dynamic between yourself. That's why when you're prophesying one to another, you are creating a dynamic where God can work because the faith of the two. Oh, help me, Holy Ghost. You're speaking something that now has to begin happening, not just because you said it, but because there's agreement and you're speaking what is the will of God. Come on, tell your neighbor, can't no devil get between what we speak here. Uh, no, no, no. When we call it, that's what it's going to be. That's how it's going to flow. That's what God wants. That's what we're going to see. That's why when you're speaking health and, and longevity and uh, the things you're speaking one to another, you got to believe when you're speaking it that you're not speaking it as something that's coming. You're speaking it as the now that already exists that we've got to call forth into the manifestation that we begin to see it as God said it. Hallelujah. That's a, so here, here's the key. Let me move on to th this piece here. I got a long way to go and I ain't going to get there. So let's watch this. Romans 8, 19 says, For the earnest expectation of the creature waits for the manifestation of the sons of God. The world is still in repose. The gods, small g, of this world are still relatively at ease. In spite of all the revivals, all the conventions, all of the gatherings, all of the conferences, you know, uh, and they're wonderful. They're wonderful. But they pretty much revive us, uh, kind of remind us we're on the right track, renew our faith that, hey, you know, I believe in what's right, etc. All right. But they're not bringing transformation because it has to have a unified application. Revelation without application never brings manifestation. I said something the other morning when I was doing the morning prayer call. Uh, Ian, you have to help me. I think I said something. Oh, when we have revelation. That uh, 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 accumulation and assimilation without application 
is like sound without amplification. We can go to meeting after meeting. We got our notebooks. We just got, oh, Lord. I laugh at our people sometimes. It's one. Of course, now I have to adapt, right? I'm an old schooler. So, you know, I was getting mad at the, the kids out there with their phones. I said, put them phones down. Pastor, that's how we taking notes. <laughs> right? I'm just fussing at them. I'm like, you're on their season. You're on there now. You're texting somebody now. Pastor, we are rebroadcasting what you said on social media. Oh, make sure you put credit, Harold Ray. On it. <laughs> right? I mean, I'm still thinking it's only what we get in the room. They're already talking to people all around the world. So now I got a little posse over there that I'm like, okay, did you get that? Spell it this way, right? Put it out there right now. Because kids on college campuses and other places, people on the other side of the world are knowing what I'm teaching, and they're not in my audience. It's less than 100 of us in this room, right? What is going on now should be published to the world at large. What Apostle was just talking about, what Apostle Moses is teaching, and, 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 and Apostle Gloria, what they're teaching us. It's bigger than this room. We're wonderful people. I like you all. You smell great. But that is bigger than this. That's my wife's little thing when she sings happy birthday to somebody. I don't know where she got that from. Happy, happy, happy birthday to you. Happy, happy, happy birthday to you. You look good. You smell good. You are good. I'm like, where did the smell good come from? <laughs> As if when you get older, you stop smelling good. I don't know what, what to do. She just, she just goes to thanking God for everything. I thank God for you smell good. I thank God. You know, I'm like, ooh, Jesus. And people just be smiling. I smell good. Hallelujah. <laughs> saints are a mess. I'm telling you what. I wouldn't trade the saints for the world. I'm telling you what. I got more. Listen, I got more stories just from growing up. I mean, uh, you know, oh, Lord. Mm, I'm going to leave that alone because I'm going to tell you right now. You start thinking about some of the old saints and things that they did and stuff. And it was just sweet. It was just holy. You know, it wasn't all this rancor and, and pride that we see today. You know, and, and they might have been, see, I believe this. They might have been a bit narrow in what they knew to believe, but in what they believed and practiced, they were right. Are you following me? As far as they knew. In other words, nothing they taught you was going to hurt you. It might have limited you in exposure to other things, but it wasn't going to hurt you. Like not going to the movies was not going to hurt me. Now, it might have limited my awareness of other things and what's going on, etc. right? Now, we believe almost totally different now in terms of the exposure. We understand that the saints should be Hollywood. Yeah, the saints should be. We should be. Listen, you ain't going to find a better show, number one. Because <laughs> the saints is funny. Let me tell you, I'm sorry. The saints is funny. Y'all some funny. <laughs> Woo! The saints is funny. All right. I mean, you know, we go, we go, pray my strength in the Lord. I mean, I'm like, if you're going to interrupt me, you're getting up walking out with your big self. You're walking out. What is a finger in the air going to do? Where do we get that from? Right. Like nobody going to see you because your finger's in the air. <laughs> I'm like, okay. I mean, when well, you got to go, you got to go. You got to let us know I'm running to the bathroom. The saints, nothing like the saints. As he is, so are we in this world. One of my favorite scriptures, 1 John 4, 17. As he is, so are we in this world. Say it with me. As he is, so are we in this world. We live in this world. We just have spiritual access to the other world. Now, as he is, however God is in the now is how we are to be in the world now, in the temporal realm. It's how we should act out. It's what our behavior should be, what should be the framework of our perspectives. Are you following me? It's not as he is coming and, and all of this. And I'm so glad that we've gotten beyond the heaven-oriented theology, that we understand that the whole purpose of the kingdom is to bring heaven into the earth, the will of God. The mind of God, the purpose, the plan of God, right? Not to wait till I get heaven. Wait till I get heaven. I've always wondered anyway, how are you going to walk on streets of gold and you couldn't even handle linoleum in the earth? Oh. 
Huh? You, you know, God don't want you coming up there trying to put pine saw on the gold. I mean, you got. <laughs> They're going to catch that next week. Here's something Greg Ogden says. The motif of the kingdom means that there's not one scintilla of our life that does not come under the authority of Jesus Christ. Jesus is Lord in our hearts, our homes, our workplaces, our attitudes, our thoughts, our desires, our relationships, and our moral decisions, our political convictions, and our social conscience. We must surrender it all to the Lordship of Christ and the directional convictions of the Holy Ghost. Right now, that, that's say that's the power of the presence of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for the Holy Ghost who lives within. Because even though we have the principles and we have the parameters and we have the Word of God, the now application of that Word requires the direction of the indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost. You got to be sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Speaking what you know all the time is not necessarily right. Right? We have to be very careful. Sometimes people need more love at this moment then they need a word at this moment. I don't think I was going to get many amens there. You see, because we can come across so judgmental, so harsh. People think all that saints know is Bible. All they know, all they know is a Bible. They don't, they're not sensitive. See, when we can do that, you go by. Now, my, like my wife, she's one, you know, people be on the corner with their little signs, we'll work for food. Now, I'm the bishop, right? I'm still of a mindset. I roll down my window and I want to go, I work every day for my food. Right? Oh, yeah, come on. That's just because sometimes you're like, look, I ain't got another dollar. Every In my city, every corner, somebody's standing on it. So I'm like, you can't stop and say, well, I gave out the dollar <laughs> at the last corner and the, and the corner before that. Sorry, Jack, you're going to have to work for your food then. But my wife was like, she said, you don't know. You're entertaining angels unaware. And I, I, I say, I'm the bishop, but I'm like, look like some of them ought to have some wings on sometime. Let me know. Because we got one on every corner. Right? Yeah. My wife said, and I, yeah, and I have in my little side pocket, I got my little dollar bill. Like when you take the grandkids through McDonald's, they give you change, I put the little dollar bills up there. Because I'm already thinking I'm going to give them a dollar every time I say, my wife is a five, ten, twenty dollar person. Oh, here, honey, give this man twenty dollars. I'm like, I got to pay the electric bill when we get home. What you talking about? But she is of a mind that of showing them compassion. Now, we will tell people, we're constantly telling them, you know, like, here's our card. Listen, we have a food bank at our church. We have prayer every day. We have this, that. Listen, we'd love to have you come. We send a car to get you, et cetera. Very few, probably 10 out of 10,000 over the years have actually called or, or showed up, right? But the point is, you're sowing a seed. Now, the interesting thing about those on those corners, I guarantee you, 99 out of 100 will tell you before you tell them, God bless you. Right now, see again. See, just being just being transparent. The, the big bishop here. I'm like, he already has. That's why I just bless you. See, y'all ain't saying that because y'all think the same thing. Let's say I know. You're there. See, see you know, don't be quoting no scripture to me. You the one on the corner. I'm in. The, yeah. But we can get a little insensitive. Is my point. I don't care how big and bad you are. I don't care if you're the archbishop, you the pope, whatever. We can grow insensitive. I'm, I'm doing a book now entitled The Fallacy of Familiarity. Because we become familiar with stuff and we're not listening and being sensitive to what the Holy Ghost is unctioning us. Because we've seen something a thousand times doesn't mean a thousand and one is the same thing. We have to be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, which is what prayer and particularly unified prayer will bring us to. He says, there's no distinction between the spiritual estate and the temporal estate for men of valor. Standing fast in the Lord, in the kingdom perspective, everything is sacred. We're the agents of transformation, imputing and superimposing the mind of God in the secular realm. That is so true. Now, we understand that we are the counterculture. We should be establishing the counterculture of God's will in the earth. We are the ones that are the disciples of Christ. We are the ones that are the sons and daughters of God, made not only in his image. I like that what the apostle was saying. I believe that as well. His image and his likeness. Two different words. Image, homeoma, it's more of a fleshly nature. But likeness is icon, the icon of God. 
right? The icon of God. Literally, and when we think of icons, if you have, if those of you that know, do computer enough, you know you can set your icon up, and you already know. When you click on the icon, the whole thing opens up to what you're after. That's how the saints of God ought to be. We ought to be in the likeness, the icon of God, so that when they touch us, they touch the essence of who God is. It opens up all of who God is, his love, his compassion, his empathy, right? And yet his principles. One of the things that we deal with so many times when we're dealing with things like same-sex marriage and, and, and uh, LBGTQ uh, 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 agendas is they come at you with, of course, uh, love. God is love. And I said, yes, but you cannot use the love of God to exempt the laws of God. Yeah. It's just that simple. You can't use the love of God to exempt the laws of God. Now, let me get to something that um, uh, here, and I've got just a couple of minutes left here. Uh, there are four areas. When I was asked to talk about how the unity and the prayer, unity and synergy in prayer helps us prepare and be not only in a state of preparedness, but in an active, proactive ra realm for warfare. We, whether we know it or not, we're in warfare every day. It's a constant warfare. Right. And, and, and part of the warfare, though, is like I said a moment ago, being sensitive to a countenance of a person that you just walk by. See, we're waiting on a microphone or waiting on some unique opportunity to witness for Christ. And we're walking by people every day, Dunkin Donuts, Publix, Publix grocery store, wherever it might be. You walk by somebody, you can see on their countenance something's not right. You can see spirits on people. We have the Holy Ghost. Now, it don't mean you got to go up to them and say, baby, let me put some oil on you. Where the oil at? Go over to aisle five and get me some oil. Bam, no. <laughs> you can walk by somebody and just as you're walking by, Father, in the name of Jesus, let your holy will be done in this life. You know, you, you can bring transformation such as that. If God needs you to be further involved in that person's life, he will see to it. I mean, I've never been, uh, you know, some people, and, that, and that's powerful, they have a boldness. They have a witness boldness about them. Now, if you're like me, I, I believe in that. I tell our people to do that. I've never been quite that way in terms of where I just walk up to anybody. Or you're like, I'm in a restaurant, and I just stop the whole flow of the, the, the waitress or the waiter trying to serve because I'm like, I'm getting ready to give them a whole witnessing thing, right? I'm not proselytizing all the time like that. I believe if your countenance and your spirit is sweet enough, I believe they'll start a conversation with you. You see what I'm saying? You have to ask, do you know Jesus? Yeah, Jesus was in last night. <laughs> See, this is, this, is, this is South Florida. You can't come here with that. <laughs> come on. We, <laughs> we're in northern Mexico, and, and we're in northern Cuba and South Mexico. What are you talking about? We got, we got it all here. So, But four things I'm noticing in the church that are combating our unity. Number one, lethargy. Lethargy in the church. Church folk come to a meeting. Kingdom folk come to meet him. And this is something I heard Apostle Frank say that I liked, uh, that I had in my notes. Most important aspect of your fervency is not your attendance, but your honor. Do we truly honor God when we come, when we're gathering? If we honor God, then we will discern the body of Christ. The Bible tells us, because I was raised in Pentecostal and it told us that, you know, you, you didn't rightly de de discern the body of Christ and so you can't take communion and all that. But the discerning of the body is a constant for us. We can't just walk over our brothers and sisters, still not speaking, still don't like one another. Still, The Bible tells you, you need to leave your gift at the altar and go get it right. And, and, and God is so clear on that because he says, it's not even if you think you offended them. If, if, if somehow, just whatever, if they, if they offended you, you're definitely supposed to go to them. Yeah. But even if you, they think somehow they, you know, you've been, you leave your gift at the altar and go get it right. Yeah. We are, we are uh, continuing on top of principled mess. Meaning we're messy on the small principles. And it's disrupting the flow of unity in the body. Familiarity is the second one. Lethargy is the first one. Familiarity. One of the unmistakable signs of spiritual malaise among the present day church is how common we treat gathering and entering the house of God to encounter the presence of a holy God. I tell our people all the time, encountering the presence of God should never be a common experience. Inconsistency. Choices have consequences. Our priorities should reflect passion. Passion will fuel priorities. 
Are we attending out of obligation or out of gratitude for opportunity? Are we praying just to show I'm a mighty prayer warrior? Or are we praying to hear and download and speak within the atmosphere the mind of God? And then disunity. The Acts 2 church was was that which we read from there in in Acts 2. It was the model. Our church, when we founded it 29 years ago now, I was practicing law, doing multi-million dollar level casework uh, as a uh, medical malpractice attorney. I was doing cases all over the country, and the Lord told me, stop making a living, start giving life. I left over $62 million of cases on my desk when I went out, and we had only been in West Palm Beach about eight months when the Lord spoke that to me. Because I was like, now, God, you haven't thought this out. Because if I was going to start a church, I started in Dallas where I lived all these years, right? No. He brings me to West Palm Beach, Florida. I don't know nobody. And he tells me, now, stop making a living, start giving life. We went on a 21-day fast. The Lord revealed to us during that time. He says, my people don't know their rights of redemption. Teach them how to live a redemptive life. The name redemptive life came out of that, redemptive life fellowship. But we, we, we from, from, from the get-go, it has been very clear to me that, uh, when we are when we are not honoring God in being sensitive to uh, what he is saying in the now, we birthed it on prayer, we remain in prayer, that, but it's not out of some applause meter that we need. Are you following me? It is to that we stay sensitive to the unfolding revelation of God. Western individualism actively persuades against spiritual vitality and mutuality. We're disunified, particularly in the Western state and in Western countries and in America in particular. We are breeding autonomy instead of authentic biblical communities. If we gather as the world does around values of individualism, then we form self-absorbed people whose empty lives demand constant fight for individual needs and rights. The church has become a shopping center where we pick and choose what's good for us. We're not a community being formed by God's word and spirit. We're individuals shaping ourselves. This strips the gospel of its power, leaving people in selfish individualism rather than inviting them into a transforming community of faith. God wants us to be healthy in ways that are greater than just what are our physical needs and feelings. Walking in unity. We're dealing in a time where we're dealing with individualism versus community. That's the way of the world. It should not be the way of the church. We're dealing with self-centeredness versus koinonia, right? And that, and that koinonia there in the Greek is deeper. I've heard people say it's like fellows in the same ship and all that. Paul says, I think it's in Philippians uh, chapter 1, actually, Philippians 1, where he talks about, I thank my God upon every remembrance, and I thank him for the fellowship in the gospel that we have. That word fellowship there is is bigger than just we come together and sing kumbaya. All right? The word fellowship there literally means it's as if there is a contractual relationship. That we are in a covenantal relationship for the carrying of this gospel. What hurts you hurts me. Right? You sick, I'm sick. In other words, I'm going to battle it as if it's my own. That we're in a contractual covenant to carry this gospel. We are living in a time where studies show us there's an optional embrace of of Christianity versus fervent discipleship. Very few people want to be discipled. Very few people want to have accountability. Right? And I'm sorry, prayer warriors, we can be the worst among that. Hello? Because intercessors... Thank God for intercessors, but thank God for intercessors. What I mean by that, you got to pray for intercessors because intercessors get out there. We have twilight zones. Hello. See, all them amens getting packed up under the seat now because I'm talking about you. But see, intercessor, we have to be careful because you are constantly operating in that spirit realm. Are you hearing me? So we have to be very careful that we're not just downloading and now we're interpreting stuff and we're bringing it out. Intercessors need to be governed. Accountability. That's where that five-fold does come from. And Apostle did a great job with that. I don't have to repeat that. But, uh, you know, that, that, that five-fold piece. I will say this about uh, 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 Ephesians 4, that he, he went down several of the verses. But the one I like the most is verse 16. Verse 16 in Ephesians 4 tells us that we are fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplies. Fitly joined together. 
compacted by. It says there that the effectual working of the measure of every part is what increases the body. So, number one, we have no room for jealousy and envy among us because I need you to fully function, right? That's what's building up the body. I don't need you to be half of what God called you to be. I need you to be who God has called you to be, amen? And vice versa. I want all of you to manifest the fullness of your gifts. I got about two minutes. Let me close this by sharing with you prophetically exactly where we are. I believe that 2019 is indeed a year where God is ordering our steps and our stops. Amen. We have to be careful about that. He's ordering our steps, but we have to also listen to him for the point of where our stops are. Yeah. Secondly, God is positioning his people to experience life on a whole new level. He is elevating unexpected gifts and voices from obscurity to prominence and authority. And he is navigating us through multiple streams of income to divine positions of prosperity because it's going to be essential for the function of the kingdom. Doors are opening that no man can shut. Rivers are flowing that no man can stop. Dams are breaking that no man can prevent. We are, and the Lord ministered to this to me maybe a year ago, and I really had to pray about it. He said, you are carrying a Kanos anointing. Now, this is what I'm releasing on the body. A Kanos anointing for a Kairos moment. Kanos comes from, the, comes from the script that says you're a new creation in Christ now. All right, old things have passed away. All right, that, and that new creation, it's not just saying you're kind of made over again. It is the word Kanos. Kanos means with unprecedented, unparalleled, uncommon, unheard of supernatural power. We are at a point where God is saying, I'm wanting to release upon my, and is releasing, a Kanos anointing. So you've got to walk in expectancy that what I'm to walk in has not necessarily been done before. Stop looking for the model. It does not exist. That does not mean there aren't models out there we can appreciate and respect. But I'm saying what God is calling us into, it is a Kanos, unparalleled, unprecedented, uncommon anointing for a chirotic moment. What does chirotic mean? That it is a unique opportunity that God is opening. The timing is right now. You weren't, you, you're wondering what your anointing is for and why God deal with you now? Because he needs you to move now. He needs you to move now. The books of destiny are being revealed and empowering us right now. The hand of God is at work defying logic, rationale, and reason. If you're going to try to reason your way through this, you can forget it. That don't mean we just, just hastily do stuff. But I'm telling you what the whole, if, if, if it doesn't scare me a little bit at first, it can't be the mind of God. God ought to be revealing some things to us that cause us to get out of comfort zones, that force us out of shelters, and moves us into a flow apostolically and prophetically. Why? Because there's a massive swelling in the supernatural, and if we learn to flow in that, we continue to strengthen our prayer life, we walk in unity, we're going to experience a time of refreshing like we have never had in the body of Christ. You believe it? Say amen. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this, your people today. And Lord, I thank you that right now the gates are open even now, oh God, over our minds that we think clearly. We stay alert, God. We flow in the full will of your, of your word today. God, I thank you right now that the gates are open, oh God, over our financial blessings, over our physical bodies, that we walk in total, whole, in total wholeness and healing. And Lord, right now, I decree and declare that no weapon formed against them can or shall prosper. I thank you right now, God, that our minds are clear, that as we verbalize, God, we speak with the authority of heaven itself, and we decree and declare in the earth today, God, an unstoppable supernatural swelling upon each of our lives today, God, blessing our families, blessing our church families, blessing our communities, blessing our nation, and blessing the nations of the world. I thank you right now, Father God, that from even this moment forward, even as they have gathered here at this resort for this uh, wonderful time of impartation from our apostle, we thank you right now, God, that we we will not leave here the same, but we leave, oh God, with a Kano's anointing that we're aware of, we're cognizant of. And I thank you right now that as we walk to and fro the earth, Holy Ghost, you're activating our spiritual limbs. You're activating our spiritual eyes. You're activating our spiritual ears. You're activating our mouths that we prophesy with authority in your word. We bless you, Holy Ghost, and we thank you now that now is the set 
time uh, of our visitation. And now is the moment in which we begin to move in the supernatural like never before. Let our mouths be seasoned with your word. Let our mouths be seasoned with your grace. Let our mouths and our minds, God, be applicable of all that you're doing and saying. In the name of Jesus, we believe it. We pray blessing upon our apostle today. We pray blessing upon his family today. We thank you that he continues to do the great work that he's doing around the nations of the world. We bind demons of, indis that, of, of discouragement. We bind demons that come to weary him. We bind demons that come to cause worry and frustration. And we decree and declare, oh God, that you just reinforce him even now with encouragement and enforce him right now, God, with a spirit of rejuvenation. Rejuvenate him in his spirit. Rejuvenate him in his mind. Rejuvenate him in his encouragement. In the name of Jesus, I interrupt every plan of the enemy that comes to cause division in the body of Christ. I interrupt every plan of the enemy that comes, oh God, to cause us to back up and be weary. For we decree and declare that we're at a season of reaping. And in the same season that we're plowing, you are going to cause us to reap. I speak over our apostle's life and I release a reaping season. I release a season of abundance. I release a season of more than enough. I release a season of divine prosperity. I release, oh God, the mind, will, and purpose and plan of God that he's speaking with authority in every nation that he shall go. Cause him to walk upon the high places of the earth. Cause his feet to be blessed and people to pour down, oh God, blessing even at the feet of the apostle of God. Cause him to walk in total health in the name of Jesus. We thank you for blessing his children that they are in total health, total stamina, that they do well in their academics. They do well in the lessons of life. We bless them and decree even now, oh God, that their inheritance in the spirit and their inheritance in the natural shall not be lost, shall not be delayed. In the name of Jesus, we bless them and we thank you now. Favor over this house. Favor over every church. Favor over every family represented here. Favor in the name of Jesus. Thank you now for reversing the curse. Thank you for canceling the devil's assignment. Thank you in the name of Jesus. Come on, put your hand together and bless the Lord.